Hello, and welcome to tonight's Return, a tabletop roleplay podcast. My guest today is involved with a murder. No, I can't say that. It's an unkindness. Anyway, while I wait for that to go through Parliament, I try to recall some long-forgotten law. Luckily, my guest knows of such things lost to antiquity, shrouded in myth, or cemented as legends. From Scandinavia to Britannia to Lusitania and the Peloponnesian War, my guest knows what has inspired and frightened generations, even stepping into fantasy, which he has steeped in mystery, adventure, and horror. Here to discuss freely publishings of Vesson, Mythic Britain, and Ireland, and so much more, is TTRPG content creator, game writer, blogger, YouTuber, and unrepentant monster geek, Graham Davis. Graham, welcome to the show. Hello, and thanks for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, Graham, before we get to some of the things I alluded to there in the, the introduction, how did you get into tabletop role-playing games, please? Well, uh, we have to go back into the very mists of time when dice were carved of flint, but um, I... Uh, between high school and college, I worked in a bank in London, uh, for which I was tragically temperamentally unsuited. And I tried to maintain my sanity by getting into local amateur dramatics as a hobby. While I was there, a couple of recent graduates uh, joined the company, and they were talking about a game they would picked up in college called Dungeons and Dragons which according to them was 50% miniatures war game and 50% improvised theatre. And I could not make sense of these two things in my mind, I'm completely unable to reconcile them. So I thought the only way is to go along and see for myself. And that's how I played my first game of D&D circa 1978. I had two characters, both thieves, both killed within the first 20 minutes by a minotaur. But this game had minotaurs and it had all sorts of other things that had fascinated me ever since at the tender age of six, I'd seen uh, Ray Harryhausen's Jason and the Argonauts on my parents' black and white television. Um, so I got hooked. And then when I went to college, I spent far too much time playing D&D when I should have been studying. Um, white Dwarf magazine at the time was a general games magazine with an accent on role playing and uh, they put out an appeal for more writers which was a red rag to a bull um, i sent them a few articles they sent me some small checks which actually went quite a long way in a student bar and uh, the rest as they say is history by the time i graduated um, i was offered a job at games workshop to uh, help develop warhammer fantasy role play and i've been in the industry ever since Wow. Wow. Uh, so having sort of, I'll unpack some of that in a, in a, in a minute, but uh, having sort of got in to the door through White Dwarf and Intergames Workshop and Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, where, where are you now in your TTRPG journey? Let's, let's fill in that gap before we then start dissecting and bisecting it as we go back. Okay. Well, where I am now um, is uh, I've been freelance writing uh, for video games as well as for tabletop games for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, with some of the folks I met working on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition and The Enemy Within Director's Cut, uh, we decided to uh, get together and form our own indie TTRPG studio. Uh, it's called Rookery Publications, as well as me. There's Andy Law, who used to run Woof Rook for Cubicle 7, and before that wrote an incredible amount of stuff for Woof Rook 2nd Edition, mm. um, and has also done just about everything you can do in this industry, from running a, a managing a games workshop store to uh, you know, developing entire product lines. Wow. And uh, along with him, we've got the, uh, the great artist uh, Mark Gibbons, uh, who, as well as Wolfrop, uh, did a lot of work on World of Warcraft and other video games. And um, a couple more Edinburgh-based writers, uh, Andy Leesk and Lindsay Law. And uh, so, yeah, we finally decided that uh, we, we'd like to do our own thing and do things that we think is cool rather than uh, writing for other people. So doing these things uh, that you think is cool and, and for yourselves, what is it? That the rookery does well i'll rephrase that so where can people find your good self 
the rookery and and everything you, you're sort of doing as a individual and collective, please, Grant. Certainly. Uh, well, we're on Facebook as Rookery Publications. We're on tw Twitter as at Rookery P. And uh, we also have a Discord server, um, which is uh, where most of our, we're building a really good enthusiastic community for, for what we do, which is a twofold sort of a thing. Uh, first is that between us, we've got something like a century in the industry. Uh, which means we, between us, we know an awful lot of people and uh, we've managed to stay on good terms with enough of them that we've had some fantastic guests for our weekly live stream, uh, which we call Inside the Rookery. Uh, last week, for example, we had Ben Aronovich on talking about Riz Rivers of London and the forthcoming role-playing game for that. He, I didn't know he was a huge Call of Cthulhu fan from way back. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've had um, Matt Forbeck on talking about uh, his new Marvel superhero role-playing game. And so we've got that, which is funded by uh, our Patreon and uh, everything you can find on our YouTube channel, which is also Rookery Publications. Um, but what we're really supposed to be doing when we're not having too much fun just chatting with people is um, doing a uh, set of system agnostic, uh, that's very important, system agnostic setting and campaign in a dark fantasy sort of vein. Uh, it'll be modular, it'll be in installments, but it will build up to a complete city, uh, which you can either use as is or just uh, rip bits out and drop them into your own campaign as you please. And a multi-part campaign. Um, uh, we've both, we've all worked on The Enemy Within Director's Cut. Uh, uh, Andy and I think a couple of the others also worked on the, uh, the reboot of... Um, uh, Masks of Nile at Hotep for Call of Cthulhu. So we, we've, you could say we've had some experience with role-playing campaigns and uh, we're uh, going to be uh, releasing that in installments. Um, and again, the adventures are specially designed, specifically designed so that they can be used in a modular fashion. Uh, you can run the whole campaign, you know, the way we imagined it, and that's great. Uh, or you can pick out, uh, you can shuffle the order, you can pick out uh, episodes and stuff uh, to drop into your own campaign. Our, our attitude is, you've given us the money, it's yours now, do whatever you like with it. Mm, absolutely, and you mentioned there's, it's uh, modular and coming out in installments and stuff, so uh, when are people able to get their hands either in PDF format or, or however you are publishing this content, when or where can people pick up this content? Well, we have a couple of short products on drive through at the moment, again, under Rookery Publications. Um, our first full-length product is uh, approaching, uh, it's in the final stages of development, I would say, and layout, um, but we haven't uh, fixed a date for release yet. So uh, all I can say is watch our social media and as soon as we're confident of a date, we'll let you know. The one thing we want to avoid doing is the sort of thing that games publishers do a lot is say, coming soon, and then three years later, nothing's happened. <laughs> we, want to, we want to be confident when we announce a thing. Absolutely, I can totally respect that uh, approach, uh, 100%. Uh, so I will put links to the socials you mentioned, the products, uh, the ones on Drive Through RPG, and of course, when when things are released through your socials and so on and so forth, I will uh, go back and add them to the, the links down in the description below this podcast. So please scroll down, support Graham, support the Rookery Publishing uh, team uh, over on YouTube as well uh, by following those links below. Now with the sort of the rookery, I was going to say, put to bed. That that's a very strange turn of phrase in in this instance. Uh, with us having sort of covered that side of stuff just for a moment, and we can definitely come back to it because I have so many more questions. But we'll come back to that. Uh, you yourself have worked very recently on a on a successful Kickstarter with Freely Publishing uh, for mm. the, and I always play with the wording or, or the the pronunciation. Vason, 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 Vason. Thank you. Yes. Uh, on their Mythic Written and Island uh, supplement release, how is it you came to become involved with that and what was it like to work on that as a project? Well, um, ever since I first started playing D&D, &D, 
I was always looking for new and surprising monsters to throw at my players, which meant that I, I ransacked my local library's folklore section and then uh, in my university library. And along the way, although it wasn't my original intention, I became quite interested in, in folklore in general. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so this is something I've wanted for a long time to do a folklore-inflected mystery-solving role-playing game that really did full justice to the folklore because, um, you know, the way some creatures from folklore are treated in some fantasy games uh, did not satisfy me. Mm. Now, back in 2003, I had the opportunity to write GURPS Fairy for Steve Jackson games, and that was a, a lot of fun, but it still didn't go as far as I wanted to. And then a couple of years ago, uh, well, probably more than that now, pre-pandemic, um, I saw Vesson when it first came out, and this was the game that I've been thinking of doing for so many years. It was mm. astonishing in every particular it was. But it was set in Scandinavia, and they hadn't touched Britain and Ireland yet. So almost immediately, I, I sent an email to Free League and introduced myself, and that's the one. Uh, also, that great cover and the internal art by Johan Egerkrantz, uh, mm is as much a part of the game as the writing is, in my opinion. It really sets a, a beautiful tone. Mm. Um, anyhow, uh, so I sent them a, a sort of half bragging, half pleading email. I'm really good at doing role playing stuff. And please, please let me do Britain and Ireland for this. And mm. uh, they, uh, they agreed. Uh, put me in touch with Johan. We had a lot of really interesting conversations about monsters and uh, I got to uh, to write Mythic Britain and Ireland. Yeah, so you are the lead writer on the project. There are, there are some other. I've got the, the PDF open on my other screen. Uh, the um, there are a, a few other sort of additional writers, but but you are the lead writer. So yeah, drawing from such a, a broad area and uh, an expanse, a collage almost of of myth law, legend, folklore, and all that sort of stuff that makes up Britain and Ireland's sort of heritage, for want of a better description. What was what was your favourite thing to bring to the book, and what was one of the largest challenges of bringing the book together? Um, well, my favourite thing to bring to the book was the monsters, because uh, I've always been a, a, a monster fan, and that's what got me into folklore in the first place, and mm. the ability you know the opportunity to uh, to take a selection of monsters from British and Irish folklore and treat them as I felt they should be treated. Uh, that was my favourite part of the book. Having said that, though, I got to write uh, three adventures or, or mysteries, as they're called, in Vess and Parlance, uh, which was also quite fun. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I think that's. Um, that's pretty much it. The, uh, the the way that the Mythic North was presented in the core rulebook gave me a really good framework for laying out the, the informational chapters mm. on geography, society, politics, uh, all the rest of that, and left me quite free to, uh, to focus on my favourite bits, which was the monsters and the adventures, which, after all, is the point of the game. Absolutely, absolutely. So of the monsters you were able to bring together and put into the book, which one of those is your favourite? And are, are there any that you uncovered or researched that didn't make it into the book? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, I initially submitted a, a short list of uh, more than 20 creatures, and uh, that had to be whittled down. We managed to, with the, uh, the Kickstarter being as successful as it was, uh, we were able to expand, uh, add a few back in. But um, yes, uh, and I have been taking advantage of the Free League Workshop, their community content program, to, uh, to publish a few more monsters via drive-through. Um, but uh, my favourite of them all, I think, has to be the Knuckle AV, which oh. is a, a demonic centaur-like being from Orkney, uh, which uh, has plague breath and in some versions it's a centaur like creature in others it's a it's a horse and rider fused into a single form as a single creature um it's its appearance is utterly horrific it has no skin 
It has black blood flowing beneath yellow membranes. It's uh, almost Lovecraftian in the, the descriptions I've seen of it, the sort of same sort of uh, visuals. But um, yeah, so that was just so bizarre and horrific that uh, I... Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And another favourite of mine is the, the ever popular hags there. They're around every part of Britain has a legendary hag or witch. Um, and they vary from goddesses of winter to uh, just sort of minor local nuisances. Um, but particularly as a, a sort of an indicator of um, uh, how to put this, uh, in medieval and later times, the, the hag was almost a, a sort of an example of what a woman should not be according to the dictates of society. And looking at that through a, a sort of a feminist and a post me too kind of lens uh, is uh, can be really fascinating. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just going back to the uh, knuckle of the, uh, just for a moment, uh, I have the, the artwork by Johan up and uh the, sort of the striking pose the the arms that the with the the claws that just about sort of scrape just above or don't scrape but uh just above the the surface of the ground in in the, the artwork it's so evocative it's it's a beautifully drawn piece uh, but what i love about vesson that i don't really see in other ttrpgs is that not only do you get examples of how to use or how to frame the, the creatures, the monsters, uh, the, the what they belong to in folklore, that they have the secrets. So what was it yeah. like unpicking things like the secrets out of out of the folklore that you investigated? Um, it was enormous fun. Um, in some cases, because as you know, Britain and Ireland are so diverse, but there is a, there are some creatures that appear with variations across the whole territory. Mm. And accounting for those variations was always, a, a, I didn't want to leave anything out, but sometimes I needed to sort of work to an average to create the creature, cross-referencing stories from different places. Um, and at others, we had uh, a lot more differentiation. And one of the things I, I did add to the standard Vess and Monster format was a, a section on variants of a particular creature uh, whenever that was needed. Um, but yes, it was enormous fun picking those out and, and putting them in the uh, in the secret section for uh, for investigators to, to find out, perhaps the hard way or perhaps not. Uh, another thing I found that uh, within this book, I was going to say PDF, but it's 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 a physical hard copy uh, being pushed out to backers soon now. I think uh, Kickstarter backers have pretty much received theirs now. Mm. Uh, Pre-orders are open for the physical book, which I believe is due in early October. The eleventh sticks in my mind, but don't quote me on that. Um, but if you pre-order the physical book, you get the PDF right away. Or if you just order the PDF, you get that right away, uh, is my understanding. Um, but one thing in here that, that helps spark the imagination and blend uh, the the real and the fantasy is the inclusion of, of de short descriptions on NPCs you may interact with during your games in your time. Uh, examples, just looking at the page I have open, Sherlock Holmes, Florence Nightingale, one very fictional, one very real, though some may query that either way, um, and Jack the Ripper, Jekyll and Hyde, Ada Lovelace, these, these characters of, of the period who are, as I say, both fictional and real. What, how was sewing these characters of, of novel and fact into one cohesive story, for want of a better description, uh, what was that process like? Um, it was very natural. It was something I, I really felt I couldn't not do uh, because, you know, Victorian Britain uh, is almost a, a, it's iconic and it's uh, the way it's seen in most people's minds from books, food, films, television, whatever. Um, it all meshes into one and fact and fiction merge. And, you know, I could no, no more do um, cover Victorian London without mentioning Sherlock Holmes mm. than I could fail to mention St. Paul's Cathedral. It's just, um, 
and the whole thing is is just greater than the sum of its parts for having this this mesh of fact and fiction mm-hmm. and you know who wouldn't want to meet um any of those people during the course of a, a campaign yeah indeed uh, the one that always catches me out is reverend child Ludwig dodgson because right. i actually know who that is uh, so reading that in the book and and for those that are not aware that is the the real name of the pseudonym i think i've got that the right way around lewis carroll uh so alice in wonderland and, and the various other stories uh so having that real and fantasy within the real and the fantasy sort of it's almost fourth wall breaking but allows you to tie as you mentioned victorian britain in in such a way that it it just sets this perfect fantasy and yet real scene well thank you very much that was absolutely what i intended to do uh, to yeah create the best possible setting from fact and fantasy and fiction and everything well uh, i'm I, I love i haven't been unfortunately i've not been able to run a, a, a full sort of game of of, of this and yet but uh, it's definitely on the cards it's it's sort of looks at me off my shelf and and calls to me every so often which i think is a, a strange thing i might need to get sort of checked out if it's calling to me but anyway uh so but it is definitely something i'm going to work on in the future uh you mentioned some monsters that you've you yourself released through drive through uh would you mind going into them because i'll make sure there's a link to those as well um yes uh i found a, a bunch of monsters. well as i say i suggested a lot of monsters and there wasn't room for them in the book um I've put up maybe six or eight now. I've lost count. Maybe a couple that are uh, from Scandinavia and then a lot that were uh, taken from my initial shortlist for uh, Mythic Britain and Ireland. Um, there's the the one-legged, one-armed uh, Fakhan from Scotland, the, uh, the Lian and Shi sort of deadly fairy muse from well, known across Ireland, the Isle of Man and Scotland. Um, For St. David's Day this year, I put out a a creature called the the Water Leaper, or excuse me, Welsh speakers, uh, Chlemegin Erdur, I believe it's pronounced, uh, which is a a lake-dwelling creature. And um, yeah, uh, just a few little things, uh, fairy hounds, trying to remember what else but uh, anyway they're they're all there on on drive through rpg if you search for graham davis plus vess and you'll probably find them all right well as i said there will be a link to that in the description below this podcast uh, so please scroll down and follow those links add those wonderful creatures uh to your um, monsters creatures to your to your game today why not thank you so Rewinding the clock a little bit and, and going back to Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, uh, you were heavily involved in writing that and are now working with others who have been heavily involved with that project. What was it like to bring such an iconic IP as, as a Warhammer uh, role-playing game to life? Many people are familiar with the tabletop war game, but uh, the role-play fantasy game, maybe not so much. So what was it like sort of bringing that through and and bringing that to prominence um it was a lot of fun we we didn't realize at the time warhammer was not that iconic um when we started working on warhammer fantasy roleplay first edition the battle game was in its second red box edition and um, the whole of the setting on world law was very fragmentary there were little sort of mentions here and there in a magazine article here on the back of a miniatures box there just throw away stuff so the first task was to knit all that together and then see where the gaps were and fill in the world from there and uh, that's largely what we did with why i'm a fantasy role play first edition and mm-hmm. uh, mainly we developed the empire because um, it was centrally placed in the old world. So we decided that was a good place to start off because from there you could get anywhere. You could go east and fight orcs. You could go north and fight chaos. You could go south or west and encounter other human nations. But um, uh, so that's that's really the only reason why this, this Germanic nation became so iconic and so uh, uh, so central pun not intended, to the whole Warhammer world. 
Um, and it just uh, stuck from there. Um, and then, you know, it became successful. We had uh, subsequent editions of Warhammer uh, started to be based on the, the world setting that we developed and, uh, and grown for the role playing game. And right up until they killed it all off uh, to replace it with Age of Sigmar, um, the whole of, of the Warhammer franchise was based on on essentially work we'd done back in the late eighties. Not even thinking that it would last five years, you know, it's mm. quite surprising. Um, and then second, third, and fourth editions of the role playing game came out. It was popular beyond all our expectations. Um, so to answer your question, it was, uh, it was quite fun at the time, uh, because as far as we knew, the stakes were quite low. We probably would have acted very differently had we known what it was going to grow into. Uh, maybe a little, we would have been a little more careful with the jokes and stuff like that. But, uh, <laughs> at the time we were just a, a bunch of kids straight out of college, having the time of our lives. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. And uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe Warhammer's Fantasy Roleplay is on its fourth edition now, available from Cubicle uh, 7. That's right. Yes, the fourth edition from Cubicle 7. Uh, immediately before I started work on the Vesson Mythic Britain and Ireland book, I uh, wrapped up what they call in the director's cut of the Enemy Within campaign, which is the, uh, the campaign from first edition, which did more than anything to establish Warhammer Fantasy roleplay and its, uh, mm -hmm. its tone and themes. Um, and I did a huge 10 volume series, five parts plus each with a companion of uh, extra optional material additional adventures, bits and pieces. Um, and I believe parts one to four are currently available and uh, part five is uh, coming in physical form, but uh, available in PDF. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I often see our releases uh, with, and now you've said, uh, now you've said that that name rings true of uh, releases I've seen on, on drive through and uh, Twitter and other social medias. So Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is a specific game mechanic and specific world and Vesson is, is very much different and they both toy with, with fantasy and, and mythology and things like that. And you, as part of Rookery uh, Publishing, are doing system agnostic. So what's it been like moving through different game systems uh, have you picked up much from sort of switching out from different game systems has it helped you grow as a content creator um i think it has yes um it certainly informed my approach to everything which is story first and figure out the mechanics later mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are other designers who like to really get into a system and figure out how its, how its particular mechanics can uh, be used in a story to, uh, to create something different and interesting. Um, but I'm, I'm very much story first. And that sort of made it inevitable, I think, that uh, I'd be interested in a more system agnostic kind of approach. Um, where uh, also, of course, you know, as a small independent publisher, we don't want to limit ourselves to one system. We want to make sure we want to remove every barrier, every reason for people not to, to get our stuff. Yeah. And the early uh, adventures that we've been playtesting with our, we have a really great playtest community already. Um, and the same adventure, which was written as a fantasy adventure, has been tested and successfully with everything from D&D &D and Woofrup through Call of Cthulhu, even to Traveller, with wow. people just adapting it at their tables and, um, and uh, having a lot of fun with the basic story and characters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, would you mind giving us just a... A little tease as to what that is uh, so when they, they scroll down and follow that link they can they know what they're looking for and know what to, to sort of um, expect almost uh, all right well what we have out at the moment are two small pieces um, one is called the well of bones which is a location um, with uh, a big backstory a couple of surprises uh, 
it's uh, it's inspired in part by those um, ossuaries that you see photos of in Central Europe, where all the or the Paris catacombs, you know. Um, and we've just, uh, as we do, gone with it and run with it, and we've got a, a whole sort of um, set of NPCs, which could also be like a prestige class, D20 prestige class, or uh, uh, a co-woof of career or something, who are uh, associated with this particular ossuary. There's a deadly secret at the bottom of it. Um, we've got some internal politics. We've got a couple of, uh, more than a couple actually, of, of story seeds associated with the location, mm -hmm. uh, plus some really nice maps and, uh, and illustrations from Mark Gibbons. Um, and then the second thing is called Mother Hoarfrost, which is a fairly short thing that we we did as a little Christmas present to our Patreon backers that we're now making uh, more widely available. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is very, uh, very much uh, uh, folklore inspired um, from the uh, the winter hags of Scotland and Ireland that I mentioned before, who were basically degraded goddesses of winter. Um, and so we've got a mother, Fro mother Hoarfrost herself, who is this sort of folkloric bogey winter spirit character. Um, we have her wicked brood the frostlings sort of mischievous and deadly by turns as behooves small folklore creatures uh we've got a, a bunch of folklore surrounding how the local communities cope with the reality of having such a spirit wandering around in winter how she's placated the do's and don'ts um the um again another little potential npc class or uh, or pc skill set there um, and as always, uh, a bunch of adventure hooks and ideas for actually using her in your game, whether you're playing Wolfrop in the north of Kislev or D&D uh, &D somewhere else or Call of Cthulhu in uh, in northern Scandinavia or Vesson, come to that. Yeah, yeah. And so much uh, between those two two releases you mentioned down through on, on, down on Drive Through RPG, scroll down and follow the links below, please. Uh, there's there's so much for GMs, DMs, storytellers, MCs, whatever system, uh, vault keepers. I'm trying to think who runs uh, Cthulhu keepers, bookkeepers, keepers, aren't they? Keepers of lore, I think, is keepers the full term. Yeah, bookkeepers, uh, yes. Uh, for uh, Call of Cthulhu. So with all of this information available, plus other games we've mentioned, Wolfrop, Vesson, D and D, as uh, and I hope. You don't mind me using the term veteran, uh, game runner, player, now, uh, or not now, but content creator, game writer. What advice would you give to, to sort of GMs, we'll say game runners, uh, so I don't have to spill the list off again. What advice would you give to game runners for using inspirations like like your content or others to, to help run games smoothly? Um, first and always make it your own you know what your group likes you know how you run your tabletop you know what works in your games um anything that's published no matter what it is a source book an adventure anything is no more than a starting point for you it's not a complete game until the players get involved with it and um so yeah don't be too precious about canon or keeping it as written if it works for you, you're doing it right. Yeah, okay, I cannot disagree with that and support that that sentiment wholeheartedly. Uh, so, as you and I and and the many game runners out there are well aware, games can take a lot of time, a lot of um, prep, depending on on systems and personal choices and things like that. Uh, you yourself, between recruit publishing, YouTube. Uh, content creation and uh, blogging and all these other things do you get a chance to sort of relax and decompress and and sort of get some time for you or is it sort of work 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 um well quite honestly this is the time for me this is what i enjoy doing and um you know there's not a tremendous amount of pressure attached to it i'm fairly free with my my spare time 
There's mm. nobody breathing down my shoulder. Um, you know, my day job in a, a video game studio, there are deadlines that have to be met. There are budgets that have to be respected. Uh, whereas working on the, the tabletop stuff, particularly for the rookery, since we all get along so well and we're all determined that it's going to be ready when it's ready, mm. uh, you know, there's, there isn't that pressure. So we can just have fun and play and hopefully have something at the end of it that people will like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. And it's, it's good to, uh, to have that team around you as well as having that, that, that space, uh, for yourself. Certainly. Uh, you yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned their, uh, computer games, uh, yeah. and you've done a few, I've written a few down. So you did, uh, Knights Templar, uh, Kingdoms of Camelot, Spartan Total Warrior, uh, and, and there are others. Uh, and you are obviously continuing to work in the field. Are you still working on, uh, should we say, combat and sort of historical based games? Or have you diversified into to other game areas? Um, it runs the gamut, really. Um... My, my current job and the project before that were both fairly high fantasy. Um, mm. I can't talk about the current one, but uh, the one before is called Solasta Crown of the Magister. It's from a Paris-based studio called Tactical Adventures, and it's the first video game to use the 5e rule set in a de uh, deliberate attempt to recreate the tabletop experience. Wow. And we've been working with Wizards of the Coast on that, even though it's not an official D and D product, and we're not mm. a subsidiary of Wizards of the Coast or anything. Um, and uh, that's been a lot of fun. I'm these days with in video games. I started as a game designer when I started in the early nineties. Was just one job title. And now it's a discipline with many, many facets. And I've progressively specialized into what's called narrative design, which is basically world building and storytelling. Okay. Uh, so I, I stay away from the technical stuff as much as I can. Hmm. Have you had an unfortunate experience with Fortran as an undergraduate? Okay. Uh, any any cool. programmers of a certain age will, will know what I mean by that. Uh, so uh, having worked on... Tabletop role games, video games, and um, sort of support content along with your studies of history and mythology. Do you have so across it all, not necessarily focusing down on on one type of content or another, but across it all, do you have a a favoured period of time which you like to to sort of live in? Terrible mm. phrasing, but uh, one you enjoy the most, I should say. Um. Yeah, I would say um, that where my mind always goes is is pretty much where Vesson lives, which is another reason why it was such a no-brainer for me and why I, I felt I really had to do this particular book, uh, is, is that sort of um, late 19th, early 20th century dream time, for want of a better word, uh, where... Uh, 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 history and fiction and folklore all kind of coalesce. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's. Uh, I can uh, looking through the, the the PDF I have in front of me and and reading through and and all the, the sort of the, the small, not just the small details, the big details, uh, the sort of the broad spectrum and, and down to those narrow or, or very niche sort of touches within the book. Um, you can really see how much you, you sort of put into it and and how I'm sure those running uh, games of this or even using this as inspiration for, for other systems uh, can really sort of dig in and enjoy the content that's in there. Um, it sounds like a, I don't know, a round of applause or a, a, a sort of a, a hearty slap on the back. And it, I guess it is because I love reading through it. I had a, a refresh of it earlier uh, this evening. Uh, or earlier today, just to sort of remind myself just why I wanted to kickstart it, be part of the Kickstarter project and, and get this. And and it sort of really brings that time period to life. So thank you, I, I guess, is what I'm saying there. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to hear it's lived up to my hopes and intentions. Yeah, uh, it, it has. Well, it has for me, and I, I'm sure it has for others. Uh, so, uh Graham, during the course of this interview, we have covered quite a lot. 
Uh, is there anything that we haven't touched on so far that you want to go into just to, towards the end of this interview? I don't think so. Thank you. I've my main, uh, obviously, aside from talking about the Vesson book, um, I wanted to make sure to get a plug in for the Rookery, and that's all been very nicely achieved. Um, so, no, no, I don't think so. Oh, You've asked all the all the questions that uh, that I can think of to answer. I can't think <laughs> of anything you've, you've missed out or uh, or glossed over. It's all been good. Fair enough. Well, then may I ask you to please remind everybody where they can find your good self, uh, the rookery, and everything you're associated with, please. Okay. Um, I have an author page on Facebook uh, under Graham Davis. I am, I'm on Twitter as Graham, at Graham J. Davis, because another Graham Davis got there first. Um, same address on uh, Instagram. And Rookery Publications uh, are on Facebook, they're on YouTube, they're on Twitch, they're on uh, Twitter as at Rookery P. And uh, also, uh, we have a very active and vibrant community on Discord, so come and find us there. All right. Well, I will make sure that all those links are down in the description below this podcast. So please scroll down, support Graham, support the Rookery, uh, find those, uh, either the extra monsters for Vesson or uh, the stuff from the Ricky Publishing, uh, the system agnostic stuff uh, down following the drive through links. And I would just like to say, Graham, thank you so much. I would love to get you or other members of the Rookery Publishing team back on the show in the future when your system agnostic stuff really sort of starts getting released the city the campaign and all those sorts of things if you'd be willing to come back of course well thank you so much for having me and yes we'd be more than happy to do that i'll keep your contact information and uh, ping you when the time is right oh sounds perfect uh and if there's a chance you are of course always welcome back to come on for a one shot be it vessel or, or another the game or project depending on schedules and all those sort of usual <laughs> conflicting things i'll certainly keep that in mind thank you all right thank you graham it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today thank you so much and for me too thank you for having me thank you for listening if you'd like to learn more about the show then go to www.snydersreturn.squarespace.com alternatively you can find us over on twitter at return snyder we have a link tree link in the description of this episode and if you want to support us, come and join us over on Patreon, and we also have a Discord server. Uh, please leave us a review, because we'd love to learn how to improve the channel and provide better content out for, for those who are listening. Uh, until, we, uh, until we speak again, thank you. <laughs>